Welcome to lecture 15 of Statistical Rethinking 2023. In this lecture and for the rest of the course, we're going to be looking at more specialized topics that are built on top of the tools you learned in the previous weeks. For this one, we're going to flow upstream to the community of Arundak in Nicaragua. Uh, Arundak is a community of Native Americans who, well, make a living for themselves and uh, households assist one another extensively. Um, like all human societies, uh, and this involves uh, lots of gift giving and exchange and and the like. And uh, anthropologists work in these in these communities and collect data on these exchanges. And we're going to look at these exchanges because we're interested in human sociality and how human societies are successful because of their extensive cooperation and mutual aid. Uh, this is a big topic in all of the behavioral sciences, how uh, human societies are cooperative and how they um, regulate cheating uh, in cooperative institutions. Uh, here's one of the most famous quotes in anthropology, at least, and also in sociology. This is from uh, Peter uh, Feuchen's 1961 book about the Inuit. Uh, Up in our country, we are human. And since we are human, we help each other. We don't like to hear anybody say thanks for that. So the implication here is that uh, aid is given freely uh, without any expectation of reciprocity. Uh, what I get today, you may get tomorrow. Up here, we say that by gifts, one makes slaves, and by whips, one makes dogs. The implication being that uh, gift giving often entails some obligation to give another gift later in return, and that would be reciprocity, another motivation. And so attempts to measure uh, these different ways, different kinds of cooperative institutions, the generalized giving on one hand and reciprocity on the other uh, are quite tricky. Uh, you can't really do it experimentally because we're interested in real communities. Um, so we must deal with it observationally. And the data that you get from these kinds of situations where you um, look at who is given who what uh, are complicated to analyze. So we're gonna look at that problem today and we're going to use um, the multi-level modeling tools from last week to do it. The data set uh, that we're going to work with is, as I said, from Arundak. It's collected by anthropologist Jeremy Coster. And um, this is one full year of food transfers among 25 different households. That's all the households uh, in Arundak. Uh, this is 300 dyads. And we'll be interested in dyadic exchanges among households. Um, so in total, there are 2,871 observed uh, food transfers between households. Now, I'm going to colloquially call these transfers gifts occasionally, but keep in mind that doesn't mean that they are, they are cognized as gifts. That's one of the questions is, are these transfers um, uh, the result of reciprocal obligations or special relationships on the one hand, or are they just generalized need-based transfers uh, on the other? Um, so how much sharing is explained by reciprocity within dyads and how much just by generalized giving. <clears throat> There's a long history of really bad ways to analyze data like this. Uh, one of the worst would be to simply make a scatter plot like this where we look at um, dyads. Uh, each point is a dyad and on the horizontal we have A gives to B or A and B are arbitrary labels. Uh, but within each dyad one of the houses gets called A and one of the houses gets called B, and then we can make a plot like this, where on the horizontal we have A gives B, and then on the vertical we have the other direction, B gives A. And the naive expectation would be if there was a lot of reciprocity, then uh, the, these points would be correlated. Somehow the more A gives B, the more B gives A. Um, what I hope to show you today is that this simply does not work. Uh, you can simulate data, and I'll show you how, in which there's a lot of dyadic reciprocity, and yet there will not be much apparent uh, correlation in the points. Um, there's a mixture of things going on in these situations, and we have to think generatively to analyze observational data of this sort. So let's do that. Let's start to draw the owl. Uh, all we have right now are a couple circles, uh, but we'll add some more circles and keep going. So the basic goal here is to understand how these gifts, uh, remember I'm using the word gift a bit colloquially here to transfer, um, are generated. And the first thing to understand is there are features of the households in each dyad, household A and household B on the very simple DAG on this slide, uh, 
which both influence uh, whether A gives to B. That is, G uh, sub AB is a directional exchange A gives to B. That's something we've observed, um, but there may be lots of things about both households which influence that. Like, for example, under generalized giving, if household A is wealthy and household B is poor, uh, then that would predict an exchange. That is to say that the features of both households moderate giving in any particular direction. Um, the other thing that could matter is that there's a special relationship uh, between individuals in the households. And I'm going to call this a social tie. And this is where the social network uh, as a concept enters into it. The social tie represents something other than the household features themselves, but something, some relationship that's a product of the history of the households um, or their common features, uh, that itself leads to giving. Uh, and this is a thing we can't observe. Uh, we can't observe social ties. They're latent concepts, like a relationship. It's not observable. Only behavior is observable. But the relationship can definitely cause behavior. Uh, and of course, this is symmetric. Uh, a and B are just labels. Everything here is exchangeable and should be symmetric. And so we make the other half of this tag. Uh, for household, uh, for the other household. That is, uh, there's a uh, special relationship of, of B to A as well, uh, and that could also uh, motivate giving um, from A to B. And these ties are directional because they don't have to be symmetric, right? So you could um, think you're someone's friend, but uh, they don't think that they're your friend. Yeah, or you can have client-patron relationships and all kinds of relationships that are asymmetric. And so we allow for that as well. To fill this in a little bit conceptually, you want to think about features of households like where they are. Households that are closer to one another um, are more likely to make exchanges regardless of their social ties. Yeah, so the location of household A and location of household B will matter. I already mentioned wealth. Um, uh, and then there are a bunch of other things, like which kin group they're in. Um, uh, but those may be regarded as networks, right? And things like friendship would be something we'd want to uh, explain as a result of a, a social tie, uh, some kind of relationship, which is not simply a product in the, in the immediate term, at least, of things like wealth and location. However, those features can cause social ties as well. So we have lines from household features to the social tie itself. This is the foundation of social network analysis, this kind of conceptual causal model. And these ties from A to B and B to A, uh, this is a dyadic, a pair of dyadic directional uh, relationships. If you have these for a full community, then you can plot them up in a network like I show on the right of this slide. And this is where the idea of the network comes from. Um, but these things are not observable, uh, the ties. And neither is the network. In fact, in some sense, the network doesn't even exist. It's just an abstraction that is supposed to help us uh, make predictions about regularities in the social exchange among households, yeah. net some other factors like wealth and generalized giving and the like. Um, so we could make predictions with this, and we could also uh, perhaps um, with causal inference uh, make predictions about possible interventions, like what would happen if everybody got wealthier. Yeah, or some particular kin group got wealthier. What's a principled approach for analyzing social network data? I already mentioned one unprincipled approach, which is to make a scatter plot. Um, there are lots of unprincipled approaches, unfortunately. And what, when I say unprincipled, what I mean is uh, they've got no generative model underneath them that is about the process we're trying to understand. There's a large number of um, approaches to social network analysis which only imagine some null network and then try to say if the observed network deviates from the null. None of these methods really work. And I give you a citation at the bottom of this slide to a recent paper about these, the problems with these approaches. Uh, the problems with these approaches have been known for decades, actually. But like everything in the behavioral sciences, they stick around until someone retires. Um, these methods don't work because there is no unique way to permute a network. It is not a simple thing to think about a null model in a network situation. And even if you could, uh, we're trying to do causal inference here, not test a null hypothesis. We need to know what did happen. Yeah, make inferences about that. Uh, so this is not a good start. And uh, uh, we should resist such ad hocery that is not premised upon um, some scientific model of interest.
So we're going to draw the L, just as we've been doing for the whole course here. We're going to start with our S demand. We're interested in reciprocity and what explains it. That is the existence of the ties. Um, and uh, you know, as you'll see, this is, is a pretty complicated but also very important kind of S demand in, in the behavioral sciences. Um, then we're going to build a generative model, uh, then a statistical model, and then we'll finally get around to analyzing the sample. Okay, I showed you this DAG before. We're going to focus on inferring ties uh, for now and how ties influence uh, transfers. That is uh, GAB in the, in the middle of this DAG. And you can see that there are a bunch of backdoor paths here through the household features, uh, like the wealth of the households. Um, these are confounds uh, that can also influence um, uh, gift giving. And so at some point we're going to have to deal with those confounds in order to um, uh, credibly estimate the, the influence of the social ties themselves. Uh, but we're going to start uh, easy. This is a point where the generative model is complicated enough at this point that you don't want to tackle all pieces of it at once. You want to go in layers. We've got our big picture. Um, we could complicate this DAG even further. But when we start coding, we should probably simplify it first and do some basic testing and then layer in additional confounds and the like. So let's pretend for the moment uh, that um, uh, it's a bit simpler. And I'll show you what I mean as we get in there. And the idea is that we're going to be looping back and forth between numbers two and three in the owl drawing recipe here, uh, scaffolding our way up, uh, climbing the ladder as it was. Um, but only one bit of complexity at a time, because otherwise it's just too hard. It just gets too confusing for anybody. I've been doing this for 20 years now, and uh, I have really have to go slow and scaffold my way up to complicated models. It's the only way I can be sure they work. So what I'm going to do is remove the backdoor pass. Uh, and I know uh, they'll come back in later, but we begin simple. We understand this thing one piece at a time. What a data, what a sample would look like if, if household features didn't influence uh, gift giving, but only influence ties. Um, and then we'll come back and add in complexity afterwards. But this is plenty to start with. Okay, let's simulate a social network. Now I'm going to walk through this code very slowly. I haven't done much of, um, of walking through code in this course, really, especially for the simulations, because they've been relatively simple. But this is a bit complicated, and it's also really useful if you happen to study social networks to be able to do this. Okay, so we start. I'm just going to make an example with 25 households, just like R and Doc. Uh, and then the first thing to do is just enumerate all the dyads, and that's what the second line on this slide does. Um, uh, the, the R function uh, uh, C-O-M-B-N combinations gives you all the combinations, all the uh, here uh, pairwise combinations of N things. So it tells me how many dyads there are. Uh, it's simple. Um, combinatorics, you learned this at some point in high school and then forgot it because you have a rich and entertaining life and it's not worth uh, cluttering your brain with this. But you can look it up. There's a mathematical formula for this and R, R knows it, so you can just have it do it. And it'll give you a list actually here. This is what we get from combinations. It gives you all the combinations. And so uh, each row here is a dyad. And then uh, we have the numbers of the households, the indexes of the households in the columns one and two. And there are actually 300 of these, but I'm only showing you the first 91 of them. Um, and then I just count up how many they are, there are. Uh, now I'm going to simulate friendships, that is simulate social ties. Um, uh, but friendships are social ties that are shared. They go both ways, A to B and B to A. Yeah. And I'm going to say 10% of dyads are, are friends. And so I just simulate uh, this list F, a Bernoulli variable, uh, across all, for every dyad, all 300 of them, I randomly make 10% of them friends. Now we simulate directed ties. Uh, not all ties are because individuals are friends. Uh, uh, some people just are very well liked and everybody gives them things. Yeah. And some people are particularly hated and nobody gives them things. And that'll affect the rate of social ties as well. Um, so I, I make a base, base rate here alpha of social ties. Um, and this is almost certainly got to be less than a half, right? Because otherwise you're, um, you've got a saturation of the network. And then I make uh, this matrix called Y here. And this is a, a matrix of ties. People who do social network analysis will recognize this as what's called an adjacency matrix. But that's not important. It's just a matrix where um, households are on rows and columns. And we can uh, enter um, directed ties into it um, 
where uh, the row is the uh, sender of the tie and the column is the receiver. And so each cell in the matrix tells us uh, if there's a directed tie uh, between two households in a particular direction. And then we can loop over all the rows and columns and simulate this. So that's all this code does. Uh, we loop over every row I and, and uh, every column J. And remember rows and columns are households, but this is directional. So we loop, and we loop over it all and we, so we get both directions. We skip over the diagonal. Households don't give gifts to themselves in any meaningful sense of the word. Um, and then we simulate a uh, uh, directional tie um, just by uh, identifying the dyad that is um, at that location and then pulling out its whether they're friends. So you see the P underscore tie is going to be the probability of a tie for this dyad. I pull out whether they're friends. That's F the dyad. And then um, uh, if they're not friends if they are friends they have a tie if they're not friends they're they get the base rate chance alpha uh, and that's all it is and then we get into jcc matrix you run this code and play around with it and take a look at what it, it produces um i'm oh, sorry i should have highlighted this uh, friends always share ties in this but non-friends can also have directed ties they're just not necessarily shared <clears throat> Now we have the invisible social network. Uh, we know it because this is our simulation, but, uh, and now we use it to cause gifts. Um, and remember in this, I removed the back doors. There's no other source of gifts in this except the social ties. Um, so we have a basic rate of gift giving there at Lambda. And uh, then we, we just loop through uh, all the dyads and we simulate gifts in both directions as a Poisson variable. Why Poisson? Because gifts are counts, right? They're numbers of transfers. They're strictly positive. And there's no, in principle, maximum. Yeah. Or at least the maximum is, is we never observe a count that's anywhere close to the maximum. And then we can draw a network uh, from this. Yeah. And um, this is the network drawn using the the true adjacency matrix is true because we simulated it and you'll see that the it is fairly sparse there are households that just don't have relationships with other households and therefore um, are unlikely to send gifts to them all right that's the first generative model remember we're going to come back and do the generative model again because we're, we're going to add in more causes but for now we're going to go ahead and develop a statistical model so that we can test the first layer of the statistical model with a simple generative model, and then we'll keep looping back. And I really recommend in your own research projects that you do this. You don't try to tackle everything at once. It's just too hard. All right, let's make the mathematical version of statistical model and understand it conceptually, and then we'll make the code. So we want to think about each dyad. There are uh, two kinds of outcomes we've got to predict, and the first is gifts from A to B, and then we're going to take a look at uh, gifts from B to A, but of course the solution has to be symmetric because A and B are just labels and they're completely exchangeable. Um, we're going to make this a Poisson variable because of the maximum entropy constraints. Remember, it's a, it's a count, um, and we don't observe any counts even close uh, to any theoretical maximum. <clears throat> We have a we model the Poisson variable with a, some rate lambda, and lambda sub a b is the um, rate at which household a gives to household b. And we put a log link on this and use our GLM strategy. So alpha will be some average rate of gift giving in the community, independent of social ties, and uh, and then we just add the tie uh, from a to b. This is just a parameter. There's no data in the linear model. Uh, well, except the uh, names of the households, right? That let to, let us know which tie to pull out of the of the social network matrix. Um, and uh, we're going to let the, the ties be continuous here in this, and so if effectively they've got their coefficient built into them, right? It's like a continuous measure of the tendency of household A to get to household B, even though our simulation made ties discrete, zero or one. Um, this is symmetric for gifts from B to A, right? We just flip all the A's for B's and all the B's for A, and we're going to predict both of these things simultaneously. Now, here's the cool part. <clears throat> we're interested in reciprocity, and so we want to measure uh, uh, the extent to which these ties are shared uh, between households. That is, like the friendships that I 
simulated and how much this then explains gift giving in the community. And so what we do is we take these ties, uh, TAB and TBA within any dyad AB, and we give them a multivariate, multi-level prior. Uh, this is just like varying effects from last week, the previous lectures. Uh, for any given dyad, their um, uh, tie variables are drawn from a bivariate normal um, with means of zero because they're offsets from the mean alpha up there in the equations at the top. And then we have a covariance matrix that specifies the extent to which there is reciprocity in social ties how correlated these things are. So in the, in the lecture last week, I talked about correlated varying effects. And here's a case where that's really essential to the research question because it is the research question. How correlated are social ties? And so there's this parameter rho, uh, that little kind of slanty P in the covariance matrix, which measures the correlation between dyads. Um, the thing about this uh, matrix that you should see, though, is that uh, there's only one standard deviation sigma because uh, A and B are arbitrary labels, and so it has to be perfectly symmetric in that case. It's just social ties vary, and there's nothing special about B or A, which gives them different standard deviations. And so this is actually a simpler covariance matrix than the generalized ones we looked at last week. So we need um, a prior for the correlation, and again, I'm going to use the LKJ uh, prior family for this. Um, and and uh, prior for uh, the scale parameter sigma, and that's it. And then effectively what we've got here is partial pooling for network ties. And this is extremely useful because um, there's much more behavior from some uh, within some dyads than others and from some individuals than others. And partial pooling can be very useful in these sorts of observational studies. Implementing this in code involves some annoying things, but don't worry, I'm here to help. Um, and uh, the annoying bit is you've got to build this custom um, covariance matrix. And so the code that does that is here in the middle of this formula list that will get passed into Ulam at the bottom. Um, I don't want to spend a lot of time going into this. I discussed this in the book. Uh, just to say that the, the trick, the real trick here is that you're going to repeat sigma sub t, that is the standard deviation for social ties, twice inside this thing. And so there's this rep vector command that I've smuggled into the code there to do it. Otherwise, it's the same kind of code you'd use for any kind of non-centered multivariate partial pooling prior. All right, run this model. You're not gonna have any trouble sampling from it. it. It samples smooth as butter. Here are the trank plots, the trace rank plots uh, for it. This is the kind of thing you wanna see. Um, and then remember, we're running this on, on synthetic data right now. So we know the answer. So we can look at how well the posterior uh, captures the truth. Uh, remember, it's a finite sample. So you don't expect to perfectly recapture the truth, but you wanna see that the posterior learns true things. Yeah, uh, that it can separate ties from no ties. And that's what we get here on the left. We're looking at uh, posterior distribution, uh, the mean tie, uh, social tie strength, um, when ties actually exist in blue. And you'll see that's higher. It's usually positive. And then um, in red, when there's no tie. Um, and that's most of the probability mass is negative. So the model can separate um, friends, friends from non-friends uh, in this case. Can't do it perfectly, remember, because there's a base rate alpha of giving in the real in the synthetic data, and so sometimes that will make it um, difficult to do. Yeah, and then on the right, we're trying to estimate that correlation within dyads. Uh, that is the friendship rate, and you'll see that the posterior distribution for that correlation is very high um, because uh, a large fraction of the social ties in the community are, are those friendships. Those ten percent uh, of the dyads are friends. And so there is a, a high correlation within dyads. <clears throat> uh, and we can look at those. We know who the real friends are in the generative model. And so we can plot those out. We can plot out the, um, uh, the tie values uh, for household A and household B, and then highlight the friends and see that, yes, uh, friends have higher uh, tie values. So what you'd want to do if you were going to do a full uh, uh, check of this sort of stuff is try different sample sizes and show that as the sample size gets bigger, the quality of the inference gets bigger and so on. And you can go back to the synthetic code and run the model and play around with that yourself. 
Um, you should uh, also uh, play around with the generative uh, model a bit. And uh, typically there will be generative settings for any particular model, which are very make it very hard to discover the truth. So you should probably fish around for some of those, right? Imagine if friends are very rare, for example. Um, but at this point, uh, we're, what we need to do uh, is, uh, well, let's, let's see what happens when we analyze the sample and then we'll loop back later to the generative model. Um, now remember, we're gonna analyze the sample with a model that ignores known confounds, that is household features like wealth, but I don't wanna, let's, not, let's take things easy because this is complicated. This is, in this lecture, we're the closest we've been yet to something that's like a real research problem. Yeah, okay. Let's load the real sample. These data are in the rethinking package and um, uh, it's called Coster Lecky. And uh, there, are, one of the tables is uh, KL Dyads, and that's the one we're going to be focusing on now. So I prepare a data list for the elements from KL Dyads that we need, the number of dyads, the number of households. <clears throat> um, and uh, uh, we make an index variable. Uh, for the dyads. That's what the variable D is there. <clears throat> and then I'm going to go ahead and uh, put in the household IDs as HA and HB, and then the actual observed variables, GAB and GPA, the gifts from A to B and the gifts from B to A. And these are the real data now. And then we can use that exact same formula from a few slides back and just pass it into Ulam, but now we just change the input data to the real data. And let's see what happens. Well, uh, we were trying to estimate a correlation, remember, uh, of social ties within dyads, and we find out here it's uh, um, the posterior mean is 0.35. So you can see the elements of the correlation matrix row there in the posterior distribution of the correlation in the lower right. Um, so what? Well, uh, th these data are ignoring confounds at the household level consistent with a substantial amount of reciprocity um, at the, at the household, within dyads, at the household level in gift giving. And remember, in the scatter plot, there was no positive correlation at all. Uh, yeah, it really pays uh, to think generatively about these sorts of problems and not just do some ad hoc thing like plot the data and tell a story, because that doesn't work. So let's deal with those confounds, those backdoor powers. Uh, measured and unmeasured things about households uh, uh, can cause social ties, uh, but they can also directly cause gifts. So let's put in um, an obvious one, but I'd like to take a break first because I understand that was already a lot conceptually. I would encourage you to review it uh, quickly and then actually take a break and take care of yourself. And when you're ready, I will be here waiting. Before the break, uh, we had uh, built up a simple generative model, but one that ignored um, confounding of a certain kind, and then uh, a statistical model to analyze it and done a basic test to show that it could work. And then I analyzed the real sample provisionally, uh, uh, but now we want to loop back and, and um, follow due diligence and take care of these uh, very plausible confounds, which are the generalized household traits, which could also cause giving independent of special social relationships. Um, these are the, the HA and HB uh, things. We know a lot about these households because these data were collected by an anthropologist. An anthropologist spent years, literally, uh, living in these communities. They know everybody, um, all their family relationships, and tons of things uh, about their uh, economic situations and their personal histories and so on. Uh, so there's like an embarrassing amount known uh, in these circumstances. Um, so we can use some of these variables uh, to try to predict gift giving independent of, of special relationships. So we're going to modify the generative simulation now. Just remind you, this is what we had before. Uh, remember, uh, all we did was um, simulate some friendships and then simulate some dyads from that. And friends are, always have um, symmetric ties and uh uh, non-friends sometimes uh, send ties to other individuals, which may or may not be reciprocated. 
right? A popular person um, might be uh, might receive gifts from lots of people because they're they're trying to flatter that person. Now we're going to simulate wealth as the kind of household feature which might matter under a generalized giving um, motivation. Uh, remember, this is one of the major uh, hypotheses about giving in communities that there's no expectation of return. Remember, with gifts we make slaves, with whips we make dogs. Uh, there is giving that's just altruistic, right? Or at least people report so. So we're going to simulate a wealth variable, standardized wealth variable for every household. That's what I do at the top of this slide. Uh, the variable W is just wealth on a standardized scale. And, um, and then I make some uh, regression coefficients here. Uh, 0.5 is the effect of wealth on giving. Richer households give more because they can afford it. And then um, the effect of wealth on receiving, BWR, is negative, and that's the effect of wealth uh, on receiving. The rich get less and the poor get more. Um, now we simulate gifts. Uh, just like before, this code is very, very similar uh, to what we had before, but in the linear models at the bottom, we stick in the wealth variables and we use these regression coefficients to create offsets for the expected amount of gifts that the communities will receive. You know, I'm highlighting that here. Yeah, so the wealth, uh, looking at gifts to A to B, on, and then on the far right, in the bottom right of this slide, um, we multiply W for household A, the wealth of household A, times the effect of wealth on giving, because household A is in the giving role on this line. And then the line right below it, household B is in the giving role. And so the B's and A's switch on these two. <clears throat> okay, now we have to amend the statistical model uh, to put these effects in. And this is fairly straightforward. You won't be surprised. Uh, we can mirror the generative model in this case. Um, and, and plug these things uh, into uh, the generalized linear model portion, the log lambda part uh, of this model. So let's compress this all together, and then let's pull out the log lambda line, and let's uh, staple some new pieces onto it. Okay, now we're going to create two new parameters. Uh, one is A's generalized giving, right? So um, we have to do this first. I know, where's wealth, right? Well. Uh, one of the things we have to deal with is that household A may just be really nice, independent of its wealth. So we're going to deal with this issue first um, uh, as a kind of confound, and we're going to let the parameter G sub A represent A's generalized tendency to give to any other household at all, irrespective of what it is. And we're going to let R sub B be B's generalized receiving. Yeah. So you think about this as there may be households that just receive a lot because um, they're politically powerful and people want favors, yeah? But there may not be any reciprocity. That would be like a generalized receiving effect. Um, and there may be households that are particularly uh, generous uh, as well, irrespective um, uh, of their wealth value, yeah? So these are uh, like confounds, latent confounds, and we're going to model these first, and then we're going to put wealth in. So just hang on. We're going to get it all in here. We do this uh, for both um, households A and B. You just see that the B's and the A's switch, right? Because in the first one, A is in the giving role and B is in the receiving role. And then in the second one, uh, B is in the giving role and A is in the receiving role. And then the rest of the model stays the same. We've still got our, our multivariate uh, normal prior for the social ties, A and B, that has the correlation row inside of it. But we need... Um, we need a prior for our new parameters, G sub A and R sub A. And that's also going to be multivariate normal because there's the cluster here is the household, not the dyad. So for the multivariate normal for social ties, we're clustering on dyad. It's like a, it's a varying effect clustered on dyads. Now we're clustering on each individual household A. So every household A, um, and also the B, but it, you know, in this, in this setting, they're, they're labeled A because it's arbitrary. Um, gets a, a, a giving and receiving um, feature, right? A latent tendency to give and a latent tendency to receive. And we're going to have a full um, uh, covariance matrix for this so that the variation in giving and receiving can be independent of one another and there's a covariance between the two, which is also something of interest to us uh, research-wise. Yeah, are households that give the same that receive um, or is there some negative association between giving and receiving? Oh, I should have highlighted this. I'm sorry. Uh, A is giving and receiving. That's what G sub A and R sub A mean. 
and uh, then we have a full covariance matrix, just an ordinary one, just like last week. And we can parameterize it. Um, just like last week, it's more convenient to use a separate correlation matrix and a vector of standard deviations, just like in the lectures last week, because then we can use uh, the LKJ correlation prior for the correlation matrix. If you had more features of households you wanted to estimate, and we could, but I'll, I'll resist the urge in this lecture, we could just make this make, make this um, uh, most variant normal have more dimensions. And then the we have more standard deviations and more correlations, but the code really doesn't change very much. Okay, let's sum up a bit and then we'll look at some code. Uh, so we've got 25 households at top, that's 300 dyads. There's 600 observed counts uh, for 2,871 individual household transfers. Um, in terms of the parameter count here, we've got 602 social network parameters uh, in total and 53 household parameters. So technically we have uh, more parameters than observations. I'll say that again. We have more parameters than observations. If you take 600 as the as the uh, count of observations, and uh, in traditional statistics or in basic statistics, uh, this would be forbidden. Yeah, it would not run at all. Uh, but there's nothing wrong with this because it's a multi-level model, and the relation it isn't the number of parameters that matter. It's their relationships. Yeah, and uh, the individual parameters aren't individually related. Uh, tied to any particular outcome. It's much more complicated than that, uh, and these sorts of models are just fine. Remember, the minimum sample size for a Bayesian analysis is one. Okay, <clears throat> so we're going to make the model again. Um, you can start with the uh, uh, list from before. I want to walk through this a bit because I know it's, it's a, a bit of a brick wall hitting you in the face here. Uh, at the top, we've got the observation model. Uh, the, the Poisson distribution for giving from A to B and giving from B to A, and then the two generalized linear models, the lambdas. And you'll see that I've added the giving and receiving there. Uh, but what I've done for the giving and receiving is, since they're going to be drawn from the same prior, they're, they're in a vector together, G and R. And the first element is the giving, and the second element is the receiving. And so you'll see, uh, for example, log lambda A, B, uh, we've got uh, A, which is the alpha, the base rate of giving, plus the social tie uh, from A to B. Now yeah, that's the first element of T for the dyad D. And then we add the giving for household A. So we go to the GR matrix and we pull out the row for household A and we take column one because column one is the giving effect, the generalized giving of household A. And then we add the generalized receiving for household B. Uh, so it's GR for household, row is household B, and the second column, because that's where the receiving effect is. I know this kind of index fiddling is annoying. I don't like it either, but it becomes very natural after a few, uh, a few uh, uh, projects that you work with it. This is also why we do testing, right? Because we make sure we get these things right, and we discover little accidents where we type in the wrong index in the wrong place. Happens to everybody. Okay. Uh, Next, we have the diet effects, just like before. Nothing has changed here. This is exactly uh, the same. Uh, and then we have the GR matrix. This is our new multivariate uh, prior, uh, partial pooling prior. Uh, the code's very similar. This is the, just the same standard, non-centered stuff um, that I introduced last week. And I explain this kind of code in more detail in the book. OK. So remember, this is synthetic data first, um, just for validation. Uh, we run the, the simulation code, pass it into the model. We get some, we get a posterior distribution. So, um, and in the uh, simulation code, remember the uh, wealth is what's um, creating generalized giving and receiving in the simulation. And uh, richer households uh, give more and receive less. And so there should be a negative correlation between giving and receiving uh, in, in the stat model, and that's what we find. We find generalized giving, posterior distributions for generalized giving uh, on the horizontal axis, on the left, on the plot on the left of this slide, posterior distributions for generalized receiving on the vertical, each point is a household, and those ellipses are, I think, uh, I forget what percent, 50% um, plausibility ellipses uh, for, for both parameters together. And you'll see, yeah, the the wealthiest households um, give more and receive the least, like that one on the bottom of the plot. That's a particularly wealthy household, a real outlier. Uh, 
and it, it gives uh, a lot and receives almost nothing. And then in contrast, the poorest households are receiving the most, and that's just like the simulation assumed. Uh, and then we've also got a posterior distribution for the correlation between giving and receiving, and that is really dead negative exactly as we programmed it. We can also, again, look at the stuff we looked at before, the ties, and um, this model is still recovering social ties, uh, but it's doing it even better now uh, because we've taken care of this generalized uh, confound effect. Yeah, and so it's identifying friends a little bit better, and it's identifying that reciprocity is really uh, quite high. <clears throat> Note that that's reciprocity in social ties, yeah, not in giving. That's the distinction. It's reciprocity in, in social ties. Now the real data. Same plots uh, for the most part, but now with the real data, it's not exactly the same plots because we don't know the truth now for the real data. Uh, but in uh, the data from Arundhati, we uh, also find a negative relationship between giving and receiving. You'll see in, on, the right, on the left sorry, of this slide. Uh, the richest households give more and they receive the least. Um, and then on the right, we see there's a negative correlation there. The, in blue, the posterior distribution of the correlation between giving and receiving, it's almost all negative. And uh, uh, a strong correlation at the dyadic level between giving and receiving, you'll see the posterior distribution for reciprocity is basically pushed up against the maximum uh, in this case. This is, again, this is reciprocity and social ties having netted out generalized giving and receiving <clears throat> yeah and this is the social network the posterior mean network we get from the inferred ties uh, in this particular sample for r and doc remember the social network doesn't exist it's an abstraction a kind of structured latent variable that is meant to predict regularities in the data to do some compression of the com complex true sample and we could use it to make predictions or to make inferences about the consequences of interventions but we don't know it with certainty and so this is not the network in fact there is no the network there are a bunch of plausible networks there's a giant posterior cloud of them and we have a posterior distribution of social networks uh, in the posterior uh, that comes out of Ulam here and I'm just animating through some random samples from it. Uh, this is one way to get an idea of the uncertainty. Networks are highly structured things, and so it's difficult to visualize their uncertainty. Um, but animation is, is one way to do it. Uh, there are lots of other techniques as well. The point in this lecture is just to reinforce to you that you should not be summarizing it with a single picture and say that's the network. And you should not do any subsequent analyses with only one network, but always with all the networks in the posterior distribution. This is extremely important. Anything you compute from a network, like centrality or any of those other betweenness, uh, there are a bunch of social network measures that people like to report from networks. We don't know any of those either. Uh, so you need a posterior distribution of them. Yeah, anything, the network is uncertain, so anything you compute about the network is also uncertain. It should be done as a distribution. Okay, um, at this point I want to remind you, social networks don't exist. That's not an insult. Lots of really interesting and useful things in the sciences don't exist. They're, they're concepts, they're statistically regularized um, latent entities that help us make predictions and inferences, and that's their job. Uh, uh, and this is in a sense like all varying effects, because social networks are, are structured varying effects. Uh, they're placeholders for things we haven't measured directly or can't measure directly. Uh, we can use them to model network ties using the features of dyads, and that's what I've shown you so far. We can use them to model giving and receiving, uh, generalized giving and receiving using household features. We've done that. Um, often another very important thing to do in these kinds of analyses is sometimes we have information about the dyads, about relationships that let us predict them. Uh, these would be things like uh, association indices, how often individuals from the households are seen together, uh, whether they socialize together, um, uh, whether they uh, share kin, uh, and those are things we could also use to predict ties. So if we're interested in understanding the causes of social ties other than they just existing as some varying effect, we'd want to put variables like that in there to try to explain away the varying effects, uh, actually. And so I want to show you an example of that. And I'm not, this lecture is pretty long, so I'm going to skip over the code, but the code is in the script, uh, in the script folder. Um, to produce all the slides that are about to come. So we're going to modify uh, this model now, and we're going to add uh, a model for the social 
network ties T, uh, but also for the generalized giving and receiving effects G and R, because we're going to make those functions of wealth now. And we're going to make all of these three things functions, uh, things that used to be parameters. So let's do this one at a time. Um, I've replaced uh, TAB with fancy TAB, and fancy TAB is a linear model. Uh, it's not a parameter. Uh, it's strictly a fun deterministic function of other parameters. In this case, there's uh, T sub AB, which is our varying effect from before, and nothing has changed about that. It's going to be estimated from the same multivariate prior. And now we've added a little regression term here. There's a coefficient, uh, beta sub A, uh, to be estimated, which is the effect of some empirical association index between A and B, which is capital A sub AB. And that's some data we might have about how often these households associate. And you'll find this in the, in the uh, RNDOC data. Um, and then for giving, same idea. We replace GA with fancy GA in the top linear model. And this is a deterministic function of our previous GA, which is still the same varying effect as before. And then a regression term. Uh, beta sub WG, that is the effect of wealth on giving, and we multiply that by household A's wealth. And this is exactly the same kind of term that existed in the generative model. And then symmetrically for receiving the same idea, replace RB with fancy RB. Uh, the previous RB is in the linear model as an intercept, and we add a regression term for the effect of wealth on receiving. And we multiply that by household B's wealth. Make it a symmetrical from B to A. Remember, this model is always symmetrical, and we can add uh, all these new lin fancy linear models into the ULAM code just like this. Having multiple linear models like this might look really annoying because, in principle, you could just substitute each of them into the into the top line, and that'll work just fine. But I find this form is much easier to conceptualize and to debug. And, and also to teach to others. Uh, it's just much more transparent what's going on. And that means hopefully you'll make fewer errors or when you do make errors, it'll be easier to discover them. Okay, so if you run this, uh, I want you to see um, on, uh, I think this is on the real data here, uh, you get what you expect. If the new predictors we add are explaining um, variation in, in gifts between households, then the standard deviation parameters for the varying effects should decline. And that's what we see here. The standard deviation among ties in the varying effects prior goes down when we add the association index that's shown in blue uh, than the model that ignores the association index in red. And that's because the association index is really associated with social ties, that is giving independent of generalized giving and wealth. Um, and then we also estimate the giving and receiving effects wealthier households. Uh, uh, the posterior distribution on giving is, um, well, it's very wide, uh, but most of the mass is positive. Yeah. And uh, uh, the posterior distribution for receiving in blue uh, is, is mostly negative. So there really does seem to be that thing, uh, this effect that a lot of generalized giving and receiving and the negative correlation between uh, generalized giving and receiving in the community has a lot to do with wealth differences. And the wealthier households give a lot more and the, um, and the poorest households receive more. Okay, there's a bunch of additional stuff uh, you can do uh, in these models. And because uh, I've only scratched the surface of social network analysis, um, one of the things that, uh, another kind of confound that I haven't uh, spoken about, and I'm not going to actually run you through an analysis of this uh, in the lecture, but I feel like it's my duty to tell you about it, is this thing called a triangle. So social relationships, at least in humans, but also in other primates and many other animals, tend to come in triangles. That's this phenomenon called triangle closure. And what that means is if there are three individuals or households in this case, A, B, and C, if A and B share ties, then it's likely that A and C and B and C will also share ties. And that's what we mean by the triangle being closed. Yeah, all the edges are there. And we see this a lot. And there are different um, generative hypotheses about why. Uh, and they could all be true uh, in different contexts and to different extents. Uh, one of them uh, is this idea that is addressed by something called block models, uh, social network block models. Um, the idea here is that you get triangle closure because ties are more common within certain groups like families or offices or uh, the Stammtisch uh, in German speaking countries. And uh, that could be one reason that we tend to see dense 
regions of networks where there are a bunch of triangles. There are other reasons too, like for example, relationships cause other relationships. If A is friends with B um, and friends with C, then uh, A will hang out with both B and C and they may meet one another and become friends. Yeah, and that's another way that you can get triangle closure, but it doesn't depend upon um, uh, shared locations or institutions like families or offices. So if we're going to think about that in terms of a DAG, just to, so you can exercise your DAG drawing skills, the idea is we have these blocks, which I'm going to call K sub A and K sub B. This is the block membership of households A and B. These could be kin groups is what I, I was thinking and why I called it K. And um, that block membership can uh, directly influence ties in combination with the other individual's block membership. The idea is that um, with... For example, the simplest block model would be if you're in the same block, you're much more likely to share a social tie. Yeah. And so the social ties are joint functions of both blocks for, for both, in, both households in the dyad. And as you see again, this is another kind of confound. Yeah. Another backdoor. Um, okay. <clears throat> One last thing to talk about in terms of the kind of networks you infer out of these things is that they're highly, they're really sparse compared to the data themselves. So if we just took the gift, observed gift giving, and we drew it as a network, uh, you would get what you get on the left here. This is called a raw data network. And it's really dense because there's a lot of generalized giving in this community. Yeah, rich, rich households give quite a lot. And so you get... Um, uh, basically, every, almost every household gives to every other household a little bit uh, in this in this community, but the inferred uh, relationship network um, where there is high reciprocity is much sparser, and that's what you see on the right. And this is just the posterior, posterior mean, but you could run through the animation again, and and you get the same impression. This is highly regularized relative to just the raw data. So again, uh, social networks try to express regularities, their varying effects, uh, and this is a good feature of using regularized inference for them. Um, there are lots of analogous problems that where we've got the same basic uh, issue. There's a very dense amount of data. Some of it's regular, some of it's irregular, and there's a, a structured latent space uh, that we project underneath this thing and to make inferences from, and we want that space to be regularized. So phylogenetic inference is very much like social net network inference in spirit. Uh, it's just the algorithms are a little different. Uh, uh, main problem being nobody really knows how to search tree space. Uh, uh, spatial um, autoregressive problems also have this kind of issue to them as well. Um, heritability inference, uh, models of knowledge, uh, for example, the um, uh, wine tasting example that I had when I introduced Markov Chain Monte Carlo, those kinds of models are meant to model latent knowledge of an individual. And in that example, it was the quality of the wine. But if wines were students uh, and they were being judged by tests, uh, it would be an issue of estimating their latent knowledge. And that could be highly structured as well because it could have multiple dimensions that relate to one another in, in, in a number of potential ways. And then personality is a famous example in, uh, in the psychological sciences. Uh, none of these things really exist, uh, but uh, they're often very, very useful for describing regularities in observations that do exist. Okay, um, so uh, in these cases, uh, the clusters are discrete, and in all the examples I've done so far in the course, when we've done varying effect models and we've wanted to do regularization, the clusters have been unordered categories, things like uh, households in this example, um, but sometimes they're not. Uh, we want to cluster on things and do regularization on continuous variables like age or distance uh, or some kind of just similarity or similarity in time or distance. Um, what do I mean do regularization in these cases? Well, for age, um, ages that are similar to one another are more likely to share similar effects on the outcome. I'll say that again. Uh, ages more similar to one another are more likely to share uh, similar functional effects on any given outcome. And so we want to do partial pooling locally, not globally, with variables like age. The same for distance. Um, entities that are near one another, be they households uh, or anything else, um, more likely to share uh, uh, similar unobserved um, confounds. And so if we were going to do partial pooling to estimate varying effects uh, 
uh, for households and we took into account distance, we don't want to do partial pooling over the whole community irrespective of distance, but we want to pool households that are close to one another more. Yeah, because imagine there's a household in there uh, where you have a lot of data and then right next to it is another household, but you have no data from it. Uh, you're going to make a prediction for this uh, new household that you haven't sampled yet. You wouldn't use the whole community. Well, you would a little bit, but the household right next to it is probably better information. Yeah, I hope that's intuitive. I'm telling you this story because that's what we're going to do in the next lecture. I'm going to teach you how to do that with continuous categories and do partial pooling. It's a topic called Gaussian processes. We're going to apply it to spatial models um, uh, where entities near one another may be more similar and to um, phylogenetic inference. And I hope to see you there. still there? Here's a little bonus. So one of the things you see a lot in scientific journals are variables that are perfectly deterministic functions of other variables. This is most often used to construct an outcome variable that will be modeled using a regression or a generalized linear model. Uh, and the reason this is usually done is that the authors uh, seem to think that this is a way of doing statistical control. That is, if you divide some outcome by another variable, you have controlled for the variable you divide by. Uh, so you see things like uh, all kinds of outcome variables, which are ratios of measurements or differences of measurements or complex transformations of measurements. Uh, the most common example uh, that I know of is body mass index or BMI. This is a very common uh, health statistic, uh, which is a ratio of mass over the square of height. And this is meant to control for height, uh, uh, how it would scale with mass so that you can get deviations from mass uh, uh, as from mass expected for each height. Um, but it doesn't do that. It just doesn't. Uh, and it's, a, it's an ongoing shame of the medical literature that we continue to use this ratio at all. Um, if we're interested in mass, we should model mass how it scales for height. And in the second to last lecture of this course, I will show you how to do that. Uh, there are all kinds of rates and ratios similarly constructed. Um, anytime you see a per something, uh, one of these ratios has been constructed. And if it's used as an outcome variable, well, uh, hold on to your seat. So per capita, anything per capita or per unit time, that is used as an outcome variable is bad news. Um, differences can similarly be very bad news. Uh, things like change scores, where you have some measurement at a later point in time and you subtract its value at an earlier point in time to look at the change after some treatment. Uh, this is almost always a bad idea um, or differences from some reference value similarly. So it's not that these are always gonna lead you astray. But they're never justified approaches, and we should really just use causal inference and causal modeling and model the functional relationships between things we actually measure. So in this bonus, I want to give you some drawn out examples using some DAGs uh, to support uh, the scandalous things I just said. So here's an example. Um, uh, from the literature. Uh, this is a preprint a pre by some colleagues of mine, and I'm not going to give you the citation because I'm not trying to shame or call anyone out. This is such a really common thing. People were taught to do this, right? There's, If there's any guilt, it's collective. This is a sociological problem, and we uh, all share in, in the blame and in the solution. Uh, in this paper, uh, it's a really interesting paper, I think. Uh, in this paper, they're, they're looking at relationships between economic growth and various things uh, uh, like kinship systems. And what they do in the method section is they um, construct uh, for their outcome variable the logarithm of GDP per capita. This is quite common in uh, particularly economic history papers. Um, and I don't really have any complaint about this variable, actually. 
uh, it might be good, it might not. Um, although, since it's a ratio, the, as we'll talk about in a bit, the first thing it assumes is any effect of, of population on GDP, if this is supposed to control for it, must be linear, right? Because you're just dividing by uh, uh, the population. Um, what they say in the paragraph uh, is, is the most transparent statement of the fallacy I have yet to see, and that's why I've chosen to quote this paper. Um, they say uh, they do not include population density in their regressions uh, because their dependent variable, their outcome variable, is already in per capita terms. Um, but that does nothing. Uh, dividing by population does not mean you have stratified by population. Let me try to draw that out for you using a DAG. So we'll move, we'll build up this DAG a little bit at a time. It won't be that complicated. So the thing to understand about a constructed variable, a constructed dependent or outcome variable, or even a constructed predictor, is it, it's just a deterministic function of the things you've actually measured. Yeah, so that's what we're going to do here. Um, we've got two variables that have actually been measured, population and gross domestic product. Well, gross domestic product is a weird one because you don't really measure it. It's also a calculation, but let's leave that aside for, aside for the moment. Uh, and GDP per capita is just a simple arithmetic function of the two. It's one divided by the other. It's not a measurement. Yeah. Um, that doesn't mean you can't use it as an outcome variable. That's not what I'm arguing. It's just that it, it doesn't mean that any th time you run a regression on GDP per capita that you don't have to include population that will it, it will have been automatically stratified by, that is not true. The simplest sense in which it's not true is the reason they're doing this is because they think that there's a line here, the red one, uh, from P to GDP. That is, larger populations have larger economies. Yeah, so if the population changes, you expect the economic growth to change. But this influence doesn't have to be linear. In fact, it's essentially impossible to think of a realistic economic model in which the in causal influence of population on economic growth is going to be linear. Each additional person uh, does not have the same effect on population growth, I mean, on, on economic growth. Uh, there would be diminishing returns, yeah, uh, in most models. That's the first reason you don't want to just do this adjustment in the back alley way of dividing, because when you do that, you assume that every additional person has the same effect, and that's why you're using per capita. Okay, there are deeper problems, though. Uh, so in this particular paper, they've got a cause of interest, which is also plausibly influenced by population. So it's X on this graph. And uh, so the causal path of interest is this one, from X through economic growth to GDP per capita. I think that's fine. Uh, GDP mediates the relationship between this cause and GDP per capita, sure. Um, the problem is there's a backdoor path here, you can see, uh, through population. And the fact that GDP per capita has used population in its calculation does nothing to close that backdoor. Absolutely nothing at all. Um, just by the logic of the DAG. Yeah, P is just a cause of that variable. And you need to stratify by it to block the backdoor path. Okay. Another example, many papers, uh, including social network papers, the theme of this uh, lecture, um, have to deal with the fact that uh, different individuals or households or dyads are observed for different amounts of time. And this is awkward, obviously, because you have more um, sampling effort for some units, and so you have way more uh, uh, data for them, and you intuit uh, because you're a clever person, that what really matters are the rates of some behavior per unit time. And so the, the entities, the households, the people you've observed the most will have higher um, numbers of, say, gifts of transfers. That's why on this graph. It's like the gifts in the main lecture. Uh, but that's partly because you observe them for more time. So the observation time influences the number of, of observed transfers. The longer you watch, the more events you see. Uh, and so uh, we need to correct for observation time somehow. The proper way to do that would be to put it on the right-hand side of the equation as something called an exposure, which I talk about in the book in the chapter on uh, Poisson regression. Um, but uh, th there's this ad hoc procedure that you'll see in lots of papers, even very recent ones, where people will simply take the outcome variable and divide it by time and then run regressions, linear regressions usually, uh, 
on those ratios. And the reason is because they say this controls for the differences in observation time. It does not. Uh, it, one of the big problems that arises from this, of course, is that uh, we have, yes, we want to know the rates, but you have to estimate those. Those are parameters. They're not things you've observed. Yeah, you can't just uh, uh, take this ratio and say that's the rate because it's not. We don't know the rate. The rate is a latent variable. Uh, you need, if you've observed uh, a count of things, you need a count model. And then the parameters of that count model will give you rates. Yeah. The big issue here in any finite sample is that when T is large, um, you're going to have more precision about what the rate is. And when T is small, the observation time is small, you'll have very little precision about what the rate is for that entity. And if you just treat all these uh, Y over T variables as known with no measurement error, all of that is lost and everything could go wrong in your estimation. Essentially, you're making um, uh, the units with the smallest amount of sampling effort just as important in estimating your coefficients as the units with the most. Another example, this is thing called change scores, which is uh, unfortunately popular in a number of literatures. Again, it's one of these intuitive ad hoc procedures by which people think they're controlling for something. So think back to the uh, plant growth example uh, when I um, introduced causal inference in the first half of the course. And in this experiment, there were a number of plants and we applied some treatment to them. This is an experiment, so we don't have to worry about confounding. Um, but the baseline height is obviously a competing cause and it's a very powerful one. And so we want to include it as well. And back then in that lesson, I included it on the right hand side. I modeled it, uh, the relationship between baseline height and the post treatment height that is H0 and H1. But it's very common that people will want to analyze such experiments uh, by computing something called a change score. Why not take H1 and subtract H0? Now we've got the amount that the plant grew during the experiment, and then we can just compare those across treatments. Okay, yes, that's intuitive, uh, but it's almost always a bad idea. The first thing that's bad about it is, just like in the case of um, uh, the previous example, uh, uh, the uh, GDP example, this implicitly assumes a linear relationship uh, in growth, right? That uh, the starting value of H0 has no effect on the growth rate in some nonlinear way. Um, and that can't be true if there are any floor or ceiling effects on the measurement. And height obviously has a floor, yeah? And it's going to have some uh, possible ceiling as well in the sense of how structurally tall can a plant get given what it's made out of, yeah? And uh, so the, the change score makes really strong but hidden assumptions about the functional relationships about how growth works in this. If you've got an experiment that's not growth, it's still, it's going to make um, very strong and hidden assumptions. And you can easily go wrong with this. It's better to model uh, how the growth works and, and condition on baseline height as you would any other variable to get things right. Of course, in a more complicated observational setting, there could be more arrows here. And then you're going to have to deal with backdoor pass as well. OK, I hope uh, those examples help you get an intuition for why this is a bad idea. And you shouldn't panic because it's very easy to avoid such mistakes. Just never do those things. Yeah, uh, Arithmetic is not stratification. I'm going to say that again. Arithmetic is not stratification. Arithmetic is great. You should do a little bit every day. Uh, it's good for you. It's like eating your vegetables. But it is not the same as stratifying by a proper adjustment set that you have deduced through some causal inference logic. Yeah, that's what you need to do. Um, arith these arith arithmetic solutions assume fixed relationships when you should really be estimating the functional relationships uh, and in a way that can deal with imbalance and sampling across units. That is all the methods I've been teaching in the class. Um, similarly, I haven't mentioned it in this bonus, but there's also a tradition of using model predictions like residuals as data in other models. Uh, this, these are also constructed variables, although they're not ratios or differences. Um, these also don't necessarily perform statistical control in the way people think they do. Just because you used a variable in one regression, you can't just take the predictions from that regression, use it in another model, and say that the variables in the, in the first regression have been controlled for. You know from DAGs, it ain't that simple. Uh, there's, sorry, there's no way out of, of 
sketching your drawing your assumptions and justifying them logically. So again, don't panic. There's an easy rule here. What you need to do is just use causal logic to justify your analysis and then test it and demonstrate to your colleagues that given a certain set of assumptions, this is a legitimate way to analyze the data. One way to think about these sorts of traditions is they're part of this uh, big malady in research that I call, well, statisticians have, have been using this word for two generations now, um, although I guess nobody knows who invented it, ad hocery. Uh, and ad hocery is a joke from the Latin phrase ad hoc, uh, which to speak casually in modern English just means something that's made up yeah, for the sole purpose of the current case. Um, and what I mean by this in, in research is that uh, ad hocery is making up some procedure for a given analysis, and the only justification for it is intuition. It seems plausible, uh, but no one's tested it. No one's got a generative model. You can't really say why it would work, when it would work, um, but you can push it forward if you can persuade the reviewers and the editor. Uh, you see casual versions of this too, which aren't elaborate things like in computing ratios. Whenever someone says in a paper, when they're justifying how they're going to look at the data with a phrase like, we expect a correlation. That's a very loaded phrase. Why do you expect a correlation? What's the causal model you have here? Right? It's not unreasonable to ask why they expect a correlation and to have them unpack it. Uh, but way too often, that's all you have. We expect a correlation between these two things. We looked for it. We didn't find it. Therefore, some argument's wrong. That is not good research. Okay, so um, the larger attitude, and maybe this is just me, is that ad hoc procedures can sometimes work, but they're not justified by probability theory, and so they tend to go wrong at a very high rate. Yeah, When they do work, uh, then it, we need to prove why using the same laws of probability theory. Yeah, Because if they do work, it will be because uh, of uh, something we can understand through probability theory as logic. Again, don't panic. Um, I'm pointing out these, these odd things to you so that uh, uh, you can spot them in other people's work and you can avoid doing them in your own. But there's a very simple rule about how to do statistical modeling. Model what you measure. Yeah, Don't invent new measures as rates and think that, those, that that is a statistical procedure that somehow controls for confounding. Thanks.